Well, hey, Doxology, good morning. It is so great to worship with you today, wherever you're joining us from. Hey, grab a Bible and meet me in Acts chapter 15. Acts 15 this morning, as we continue this look through the book of Acts that we're calling Centrifugal. We've been looking at how the only explanation for why you and I know anything at all about the story of Jesus, much less this thing called church, is something called centrifugal force, the kind of force that launches from a center. And we've said at the center of Christianity, it wasn't stories, it wasn't tradition, it wasn't rules or religion or rituals that were central to the earliest followers of Jesus. It was a resurrection. They ate breakfast with a person that they'd seen executed just a few days before. They'd had conversations over the course of 40 days with a person that they'd seen crucified. And ultimately, they stood on a mountain with him as he told them his plan for them to take life to the world. And it wasn't for them to start a new religion or a moral code or a voting block. He promised them that he would be with them, that God the Holy Spirit would empower them so that they could be his witnesses. A witness is someone who's willing to talk about something that they've seen or heard or experienced to anyone who finds themselves on a search for what's true. So from the very beginning, that's what church was. It wasn't an institution trying to recruit a bunch of people to show up and watch a program with them. It was a gathering of witnesses, people who had seen and heard and experienced the resurrected Jesus and the present power of God in their life who never wanted to get over it. So they reoriented their lives and their schedules to make sure they wouldn't. But, and this is so important, they didn't just do it for their own sake. They didn't see the gathering primarily as a place where convinced people would come and be fed. They saw the gathering as primarily a place that they would come and refuel because they believed when the resurrection lands on you, it always launches you. Centrifugal force, which is the whole idea of the whole book of Acts, which means Doxology Church. Just play it out. We don't and can't ever measure our church's success by how many people show up, how comfortable we feel when we're here. We have to measure our church's success by how many people from our neighborhoods to the nations are nearer to Christ because of how and where the resurrection launches us when we leave from here, wherever here is. And listen, that has never been more important than it is on this day during this season in our world, as cultures clash all around us, and come on, even within us. I am so glad we're to this passage on this day. Today, we're looking at the moment in the book of Acts where the whole movement nearly comes apart. Acts 15 shows us the two greatest threats that there are to the movement of life with a capital L towards the world. It's actually one threat that shows up in two different ways. And neither of them is the thing that you may have come in this morning thinking is the greatest threat to the church and our mission today. That's what makes it so important. The greatest threat to the future of the church is not a political agenda or a political leader or any kind of political pressure. The greatest threat to the future of the church is not persecution. In fact, you see all of those things in the book of Acts. And you actually see the mission of the church thriving under all of it. It doesn't stop the message of life. It accelerates it and even amplifies it. In Acts 15, we see two huge threats to the mission of Jesus, to send life to the world. And they're important to pay attention to because the exact same thing that threatened them in those days threatens us and our mission these days, and we have to be aware of what they are. Are you ready? Look with me at Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So remember, the message of resurrection has moved from a small group of people in the equivalent of a neighborhood to a whole city 
and then from that city to the nations. And here's why that's important. When it started, it started with people who led different lives but had basically the same starting points. They all knew mostly the same stories, had same of the same customs and traditions, and assumed the same moral and ethics. Even if they were on different sides of the morals and ethics, the tax collectors and the people that they stole from all pretty much agreed that what the tax collectors were doing was shady. Does that make sense? But then in Acts chapter 8, suddenly the message starts to go to other people. Acts chapter 11, you get a church in Antioch that's filled with people who don't have the same background or traditions or sets of assumptions who don't have really any interest in looking Jewish for what it turns out are some obvious and uncomfortable reasons. And some of the people back in Jerusalem find out about it and they say, okay, hang on a second. I mean, it's really exciting what's happening with these non-Jewish people that are putting their trust in Jesus. But remember, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah who came to Jerusalem first. Like the majority of us are Jewish We don't have any problem with people who are different from us putting their trust in Jesus, but they're going to need to look like us in order to really be one of us, right down to the most personal detail. You tracking with me? Think about what they're saying. If they believe what we believe, they'll behave like we behave. And if they don't behave like us, it'll be proof They're not saved like us. So the church in Jerusalem sends a group to the church in Antioch to make sure the church in Antioch hears this message. The good news is that you are loved by God. He sent Jesus to die for your sins. You can be forgiven if you put your trust in him and your men get circumcised. That was their message. Okay, think about this. Circumcision isn't the thing for us today. Some of you are in launch class starting this week at Doxology. Okay, fellas, don't expect an inspection. That's good news for all of us, right? Okay, but don't rush past this. Here's the point. Your men get circumcised is not the thing in our blank. But the chances are, if you've been around churches or church people for long, you've heard Other things put there. You're loved by God. He sent Jesus to die for your sins. You can be forgiven if you trust him and vote this way. Change the way you dress. Promise something. Give something. Give up something. Stay away from something. Change your view on something. Show up to something or walk away from something. I mean, it's some version of Jesus plus something. Can I give you a real life example? Not that long ago, I was standing right here in this auditorium between services when a guy walked down front, shorts, t-shirt, waited around. I could tell he wanted to talk to me, and finally I I got to him, and he said, "Um, hey, I, I, I just needed a check. Is it cool for me to be here today? I said, uh, yeah, I I think. Um, anyone's welcome here. Why? Immediately started crying. He said, man, my life has fallen apart. I just know I need to be in a church. But I tried to already this morning, and they both asked me to leave. And I'm like, what? He said, yeah. They said I had to either cover up my tattoos or leave. He had them all down his arms, all down his legs. That's ridiculous, right? Now, I could tell you other stories that you wouldn't think were quite as ridiculous because they touch on some of the things that make you uncomfortable when people show up at a place like this. The point is, you have to pay attention to what you put in that blank. Here in Acts 15, it's circumcision. It's great you believed, but to prove it, you need to... Look what happens, verse 2. Verse 2 says, This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So, Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. About what question? What's the question? What goes in the blank? You can be forgiven and find life if you trust in Jesus and what? And you notice, they think it's a big deal. 
It's not just one of those, well, you do you, and we'll do us, and we'll sing Kumbaya at the end of the story. It's a big deal. That's going to become important a little bit later. They have sharp dispute and debate over what goes in the blank. And when it's unresolved, they believe it's important enough to take a 300-mile walk all the way back to Jerusalem to hash it out together. Questions about what a person has to do to be right with God are the most important questions there are, aren't they? So Paul and Barnabas go all the way back to Jerusalem to talk to Peter and James and the others about the question. Look what happens. Skip down to verse 5. Then some of the, notice this, believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Okay, so I can't resist pointing this out because it's evidence of what we keep saying. Okay, you remember the Pharisees, right? They're the ones responsible for having Jesus arrested and crucified. And now, 20 years later, some of them are believers who get invited to this leadership meeting of the church. Okay, what was the thing that convinced them? I'll tell you, it wasn't the story of the Good Samaritan or the prodigal son. It wasn't that they suddenly saw all the apostles behaving so magically well. They just knew they'd been wrong about Jesus. It was the resurrection. They were witnesses, and they knew witnesses. The man they crucified rose from the dead and offered them forgiveness, and they never got over it. But some old habits die hard, don't they? You notice their answer to the question, what goes in the blank? They say, circumcision, yes, but really, it's the whole law of Moses, all 613 commandments. They escalate it, and pay attention to this, because it always escalates. And when we do it like they do it, we do it for all the right reasons. I think it probably happened to the Pharisees for mostly the right reasons. We want to be serious about the message. We want to be doxology, showing and telling who Jesus is and what he's like wherever we're sent. And we want to do it the right way. And we want to make sure everybody else does it right, too. Sometimes in our desire to protect the message, we start managing what the message has to look like. How it has to dress, how it has to sound, what it's allowed to struggle with, what it's allowed to listen to and drink and where and when, how specifically it has to behave. And before we realize that we're doing it, we start sticking all of those things in the blank, either implicitly or explicitly. We say to the people around us, in order to be forgiven, you have to believe in him. And behave like us. Is it right to take the message seriously? Well, you bet. That's why verse 7 tells us there was much discussion. But then Peter stands up and he begins to speak. Look what he says, verse 8. He says, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them, that's the Gentiles, by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us Jews. Look at this. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? You hear what he's saying? He says, hang on a second, guys. You're forgetting where our story starts. Like, guys, I hate to be the one that says it out loud. I've never been good at keeping the rules. Come on. You haven't either. And we grew up with this stuff. Like God didn't look down at us from heaven and say, wow, what moral, righteous, well-behaved people those fishermen and Pharisees are. I better get down there in a hurry and get them on my team. And Peter's going, hey, he called me Satan. He called you knuckleheads whitewashed tombs. Okay, our story is this. Jesus saw us loved us, came to rescue us, and will forgive us if we put our trust in him. And there is nothing in the blank. The blank was blank for us. Why would we fill it in for them? Then James stands up. James is the pastor of the Jerusalem church. We read his letter a little earlier in this pandemic. And he says, hey guys, Peter's right. And remember why God gave us the law. He brought us together. He gave us our law so that we would look different from the rest of the world. Not as an obstacle to entry, but as an obvious demonstration of who we are. 
so that when the rest of the world starts looking for a God who won't let them down like all of the other gods have let them down, we can tell them and show them that that God is looking for them. And James comes to the conclusion, verse 19. He said, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Now think, that's a huge statement for James, the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Like, this is not a statement that was in his own personal best interest, I promise. Like, it, it was a decision that he was probably not personally comfortable with. Like, oh my gosh, if we do this, they're probably going to eat bacon and even serve it at church on Father's Day. I can promise you this was not a comfortable decision for James pastorally. Okay, the church down the street got bigger the next Sunday. But because James believed in the message, because he held the message of the message so highly, he was willing to say, gang, if there is an obstacle, any obstacle that we can eliminate to make it simpler for people who are coming to God to come to God, I think we should do that. We can't compromise the message for the sake of our comfort or our preferences, or our opinions, or our passions, or our causes, or even our deeply held convictions about how people ought to behave. Nothing goes in the blank. If you add something to the message, you change the message. Related to what we're talking about this whole series, you destroy the power of the message. I mean, think centrifugal force. If you have a top, you know, like the kids play with, and it's spinning around in a circle, forcing, like pushing out from the center, and then you attach something to it on one side, it changes the center, doesn't it? And suddenly, what happens to the centrifugal force? Well, two things. It slows down, and it spins out. The power goes away. That's why this is such a huge threat to the church and the mission of God, the mission that he's called us to. We are not witnesses of how God can make good people better. We are witnesses to how God can make dead people alive. Our message is not do. Our message is done. Look, religion and really every religion in the whole world, is spelled D-O. Because it consists of all the things people have to do or stop doing in order to make God happy or keep him happy. Christianity is not spelled D-O. It's spelled D-O-N-E. It's the good news that what we could never do for ourselves, Jesus has done for us. All we do is refuse to refuse his gift. The last words of Jesus on the cross were, it is finished, not go fix yourself, right? Our message isn't Jesus plus anything. It's just Jesus. Nothing goes in the blank. That's what sets this message apart from literally every other religion in the world. So James says, hey, we can't change the message. But he goes on to say, that doesn't mean we shouldn't stay great messengers. In fact, look what he says, verse 20. He says, instead, we should write to them, that is the church people in Antioch, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Sounds like kind of a random list, doesn't it? But it's not. See, Greek worship is all about finding identity and fulfillment and blessing through the expression of sex and sexuality. That's a little familiar, right? James says, if you do that, it will make it hard for the Greeks who are coming to God to see that there's anything different about your God than just another one of their gods. And the food sacrifice to idols and meat that was strangled thing, those were obvious in-your-face offenses to Jewish people who didn't know Jesus. So James says, listen, even if you have freedom, don't be so free about your freedom that someone on their way to Jesus would fall all over you. 
Essentially, he says, don't raise the bar for entry to anyone, but raise the standard for yourself in front of everyone. And in every situation, look at your life and your message and ask the question, is there anything in my life that would make it hard for someone near me to believe good news from me? And if there is, lay it aside. It doesn't mean you have to give up your convictions, whatever they are. It just means you refuse to make your behavior the bar that people have to clear for you to count them as followers of Jesus. God's purpose for you is to empower you to be a witness to the message of resurrection for people who need it wherever he sends you. Don't let anything detract or distract from that. And then look, James says it, and then the leaders model it. And check this out. We won't spend much time here, but I think we have to see this, especially this morning, especially in the world we live in. The purity of the message is the most important thing you'll hear today. The way they live it out is 1A. Look what happens. They write a letter. They send it back with Paul and Barnabas. Then check out verse 30. So the men were sent off, and they went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the Greek believers. And after spending some time there, they were sent off by the Greek believers with the blessing of peace. Remember that. To return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. (laughs) I love that. Church, we have to grab a hold of that if we're going to be resurrection kind of people in the places Jesus is sending us today. Look, the people heard the message and were glad. And these guys, Silas and Judas, guys with Jewish names, used their platform and their voice to say much to encourage and strengthen the Greek-speaking believers. And then the believers sent them off, did you notice that? With the blessing of peace. Listen, it is hard to underestimate what a gigantic deal that is. See, at this moment, they probably still disagreed with each other. They still weren't probably completely comfortable with each other. Like, I'm sure there were all kinds of awkward and challenging and difficult conversations between all of these people. This wasn't the end of the conversation. In fact, if you've read Colossians and Galatians and Philippians and Ephesians and First and Second Timothy and Titus, you know this issue keeps creeping back up. Like, the conversation didn't make everybody instantly the same. It didn't work in the opposite direction of the way that it started, right? It started with circumcised people saying, if you believe like us, you'll behave like us. It doesn't end with the uncircumcised people saying, if you believe like us, now you'll behave like us. It just keeps coming up. It stays a conversation. And when they departed company, after hard conversations, the believers sent the believers away with the blessing of peace. No, you're an idiot. Thanks for playing. None of that. No, I hope you get run over by a camel on the way out of town. Right? No good riddance, not even bless their hearts. These people who disagreed with each other on something really important to all of them wished that the person on the opposing side of the argument would experience the blessing of shalom, a life that God holds together because he's at the center of everything. You see that? Now come on. I wonder if that's your heart posture, Republicans. For the believers who voted Democrat in this last election. Bless you. God's peace be on every aspect of your life. People that voted Democrat, for the believers who voted Republican, I wonder if that's your heart posture towards the believer in your life who believes wearing masks is really important, or toward the believer who believes that mask wearers are listening to the wrong science towards people whose perspective on moral issues or social issues or parenting issues or racial issues or cultural issues when it doesn't look like yours yet and it might not ever look like yours. Are you able to keep the blank blank and to believe that the power of God is strong enough to change them like it's changing you? And that the resurrection of Jesus is strong enough to hold them firm like it's holding you. 
And if you'll let it stay at the center, the power of resurrection is strong enough to hold the two of you together, even when you don't agree on really important things. Because Jesus is at the center of all the things. That's our only hope. As people like us, in a world like ours, during times like these, Jesus' resurrection is all we've got. And that's great news. Because all we've got just so happens to be all we need. Would you bow your head with me? You know, it's possible this morning that you find yourself realizing your whole life, you've had stuff in the blank. God loves me, sent his son to die for me, offers to forgive my sin if I trust him and start behaving better, keeping the rules, cleaning up my act, promising to do better, trying as hard as I can to be as religious as I can for as long as I can. Whatever you put in that blank. The bad news about that is that you realize this morning you've had your trust in a different message altogether. It was trust in a religion, D-O, that may have just so happened to have Jesus' name in it. And there's no life in that. There's no victory in that. No power in that. No hope in that. Because you can't do that. But the good news this morning is that the offer still stands. God loves you. He sent his son to do all that you couldn't do. He chose to take your death and to give you his life. And all you have to do is refuse to refuse the gift. And if that's you this morning, I'd invite you right where you're at to solidify that trust by saying it to him in the privacy of your heart in the form of a prayer right where you sit. Lord, I've been trying to do all these things to make you happy and to keep you happy. And it's kept me from seeing what Jesus has actually D-O-N-E. But this morning, I'm putting my trust in what he's done, no longer in what I can do. I believe he died for me and rose from the dead, and I want that to be central to my life and my hope and my message from this moment on. Lord, would you let that be true for all of us? And would you let resurrection be squarely in the center of everything we say and everything we show everywhere you send us all from here. We ask it in the name of the all-sufficient Jesus. Amen.